Dear friends of Brown China Summit, I hope you and your family are well in this uncertain time. While we have to move Brown China Summit 2020 online, we still believe that now is as important a time as ever before to bolster dialogues on the defining issues of our time. My name is Michael Chen, a current Brown undergrad concentrating in international relations economics. Today, on behalf of Brown China Summit, I'm honored to present our keynote speaker, Dr. William Overholt. Dr. Overholt is currently a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, the author of nine books, including The Rise of China in 1993 and China's Crisis of Success in 2018. He has been involved with China in different walks of life. He spent 16 years doing policy research at think tanks, 21 years running investment banking research team, and 12 years at Harvard. He has been a consultant on strategy planning and foreign affairs on many corporations, banks and government departments, as well as a political advisor to several of Asia's and Africa's major political figures at turning points in their history. During 2013 to 2015, he also served as a senior fellow and then president of the Fund Global Institute in Hong Kong. Among the exchanges I've had with Dr. Overholt, he also noted that back when he was an undergrad at Harvard in 1967-68, a time when China was closed and mysterious, he organized the then Harvard China Conference, a predecessor to conferences like Brown China Summit. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to today's keynote speaker, Dr. Overholt. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. I'm delighted to be involved in this very important uh, Brown uh, China Conference. I titled my talk today, uh, China and America, a new game because I believe we are in a new game, uh, different from the rising power, established power uh, games that happened before World War II. Sometimes when alterations are made in a game, uh, very fundamental things change. You take a baseball, make it bigger and a little softer, you have a different game, softball. You have to pitch underhand instead of overhand. Uh, uh, I believe that our scholars and officials are misreading the lessons of past centuries uh, for Sino-American relations today. I'm going to start and end with uh, describing the new game and how we need to manage in it. Uh, but in the process, I want to go over some very fundamental aspects of Chinese American relations. My key messages are military conflict is far from inevitable. We have very serious conflicts with China but also enormous common interests. China is not a demon and our allies are not angels. We need to live in the world as it is, not the world as we wish it would be. To continue as a world leader, America has to play in the new game, not the old one. So let's start. Uh, is war with China inevitable? A common baseline for discussion these days is the Thucydides trap. Uh, a series of historical studies have shown that uh, since the time of the ancient Greeks uh, up to World War II, the conflicts between rising powers and established powers have led to war about three quarters of the time. I'm going to argue that that baseline doesn't work for predicting what happens in the post-World War II period. In the old era, before World War II, conflicts were typically between neighbors, Athens and Sparta, Germany and France. And the way you became a, a big power or stayed a great power was to use your military to grab pieces of your neighbor's territory. 
that's changed. It's changed for two reasons. First, after World War II, we learned how to grow economies much more rapidly. Second, military technology became so destructive that if you play the game the old way, the usual outcome is that both sides lose. As a result, the modern path to great power leadership has been primarily economic. This is a, a fundamental shift in the way the world works, a new game. To miss that, as most of our international strategists do, is rather like an economist having missed the Industrial Revolution. In the Cold War, the US, of course, needed a superior military. The Berlin airlift, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the conflict with the Soviet Union was decided by economics. We developed a strategy of first reviving Germany and Japan, and then using what are called the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, GATT, WTO, we created a network of development. It kept us economically strong, it strengthened our friends and our allies, and it, it created the self-sustaining global network. The Soviet Union, on the contrary, put essentially all of its resources into the military, and they ended up going bankrupt. The end of the Cold War was a bankruptcy. What about other countries? Well, Japan became a big power without much of a military. South Korea started off inferior to North Korea economically, politically, militarily. And then General Park Chung-hee shifted the emphasis away from the military to economic development, while North Korea continued to focus on the military. Now South Korea's economy is 50 times, five zero times the size of the North Korean economy. Indonesia until the 1960s claimed most of Southeast Asia. It was uh, economic basket case and uh, the discontent meant that Indonesia had more violent Islamic jihadis than the entire rest of the world combined. Then Suharto shifted to focus on the economy and abandoned most of the claims to the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, the resulting growth stabilized Indonesia. Uh, jihadis essentially evaporated and Indonesia became the acknowledged leader of ASEAN. Notice it gave up its traditional territorial and military claims uh, in order to focus on a winning strategy. In China, Deng Xiaoping cut the military from 16% of GDP to 3%. And he settled most of China's land border disputes in order to focus on economic development. The result was a takeoff that made China a, a very big power long before the current military buildup started. So the path to becoming a, a big power has become an economic strategy supported by a strong military or by an ally with a strong military. Economic strategies differ from military strategies in that both sides can win. 
When France wars with Germany, one wins, the other loses. When the US competes with China, both can prosper. Moreover, China's 8,000 miles away. The territorial issues are trivial. If we behave like a pre-World War II power, we can make the Thucydides trap a self-fulfilling prophecy. To some extent, we're doing that, as are the Chinese and the Japanese. If we play the traditional Thucydides trap game, then Graham Allison's marvelous book about the Thucydides trap becomes a, an eloquent guide to what will happen to us. Or maybe we just lose our leadership by bundling the economic strategy. With China, we Americans have some very fundamental conflicts. Some of the predatory maritime policies of China, its exclusion of uh, foreign companies from its market while it tries to take over whole global markets for its companies, uh, these have to be confronted firmly. At the same time, we have enormous mutual interests, which tend to be discounted today. For instance, China is much more open to our trade and investment than our allies, Japan and South Korea are. Among many things, many other things, that openness enabled General Motors to survive and, and save millions of automobile related jobs. Effective Sino-American collaboration has led to the greatest reduction of poverty in the history of the human race. For the first time in 315,000 years, we humans have more basic goods, more food, more clothes, more shoes, more toys than the world actually needs. We still have a distribution problem, but we've had a surfeit. There are unpublicized national security benefits from that incredible reduction of poverty. Sino-American collaboration has midwifed the world into a post-industrial era where the majority of jobs are in the service sector. Moving away from the back-breaking labor of traditional agriculture and manufacturing. Sino-American collaboration has given the world the only hope of addressing the most fundamental challenges of the next generation, namely climate change and environmental remediation. If China were still as poor as India, we would have no hope of solving these problems. I'll elaborate on the national security benefits of all this later. But you never know all of this from reading or listening to most of our politicians these days. They particularly like to blame China for our own failure to adjust to the changes of an automation society. Our society was severely stressed by losing 3 million manufacturing jobs, mainly to automation. When China had to move 45 million people out of manufacturing jobs in the same period of time, a decade, things were mostly manufacturing jobs. It moved them into service economy jobs and did not take the opportunity to blame us for the changes. How about maritime issues with our allies? That seems like a Thucydides kind of problem. 
uh, these problems are important but complicated. Uh, Chinese behavior in the South China Seas, uh, particularly its militarization of rocks there, is destabilizing. China broke its promise not to militarize the air, the area. China broke its promise to withdraw from Scarborough Shoal. China signed the Law of the Seas Agreement and then violated it. It's important to add that China is building dams that divert vitally needed water from millions of Southeast Asian people who are becoming impoverished as a result. But there's another aspect that we tend to read less about. China's behavior pretty much reflects the previous behavior of our friends and allies. China's just late and on a Chinese scale. The claims of smaller Japan cover twice the amount of the ocean as China's claims. The model for China's island building is Japan's earlier buildup of Okinotori Shima, a rock about halfway between Taiwan and Guam. Japan's territorial claims around Okinotori Shima at 400,000 square kilometers are much more expansive than any of China's claims around South China Sea rocks. If you apply the Hague Tribunal standards to the Senkaku Yayu Islands, they're rocks, not islands. Japan really doesn't have a right to draw big circles around them. US policy for decades acknowledged that China's claims to those rocks are as, as valid as Japan's. In 2012, Japan's government ignored our warnings not to buy those islands for, from a private arm. Japan went ahead, thereby breaking a 40 year peace understanding with China. We then turned around and emphatically backed, uh, backed Japan and treated China as an aggressor. What that did was to effectively turn over the issue of war and peace between the United States and China to the kooky right-wing politician in Japan who started the idea of buy, buying the islands. The American base in Diego Garcia, which is the key to our Indian Ocean role, rests on British control, and that is offensive to United Nations standards as China's claims in the South China Sea. Finally, US use of surveillance aircraft and, and, and naval vessels to provoke Chinese defenses and read electronically how they would react in a real conflict uh, evokes the strongest fears and negative reactions in China based on their experience of a century of predation by the West from the sea. Our most distinguished strategists like the late Zbigniew Brzezinski have said that this is counter counterproductive behavior, but we still do it. So uh, we have serious valid grievances about Chinese behavior, but we live in a glass house and we have to be pretty careful how we throw stones. So how do we manage relations with this rising power? Let's start with some very basic perspectives. 
First, unlike the Soviet Union, China's not going to collapse. Unlike the Soviet Union and today's Russia, it has a competitive, sustainable economy. Moreover, it has taken care of its people to a degree that's rare in the modern world. In 2015, the number of families in China who own homes was twice the number of Indian families who had access to a toilet. China's system is economically and socially sustainable. Second, on the other hand, China is not destined for rapid growth indefinitely. Its current administration is seriously mismanaging China's economy. The things our politicians denounce, like their 2025 industrial plan, are, are things that should actually make them happy. China's making the same mistakes that Japan made in the late 1970s. It's turning inward. It's turning control of its economy over to a group of giant traditional industrial enterprises. Beyond that, this Chinese administration is giving a party committee in every business final control over strategic business decisions. Can you imagine what would happen in America if we put one of our politicians in charge of final strategic business decisions in every one of our companies? So China's growth is slowing. It's weaker than the figures show. It's gonna slow more. Three decades of uh, extraordinary resources with government revenues growing twice the level of a fast growing economy have created a bull market mentality in China. Bull markets and bull market mentalities always lead to tears. Third, within a few years, China will change dramatically. Its political strategy of maximizing political control is at war with its economic strategy of uh, market efficiency. China's elite political tides are shifting against Xi Jinping. China's decades of rapid growth have made generational change extremely sharp. And now general generational change is overdue. China will experience fundamental change. It might get much worse. It might get much better. It will not remain the same. We therefore need to position our country for a variety of outcomes. Contrary to much of the strategic dialogue there, there isn't one real China with one set of, of goals. It changes frequently. We have to be ready, or ready for an even nastier authoritarianism and an attempt to subdue Taiwan. We also need to be ready for a more liberal, more friendly China. Foreigners cannot ensure a good outcome. But if we lock ourselves into a Cold War mentality, we can certainly ensure a bad outcome. Can we live with the China model? A lot of US commentators argue that any big country with a system different from ours is a fundamental threat to our system. That lesson was learned from the depredations of Nazi Germany and the former Soviet Union. 
But unlike those dictatorships, China is not trying to impose its model on other countries. China thinks its model is unique. It's wrong about that because all the major elements were copied from earlier Asian marital economies. But the idea that it's unique uh, deters thoughts of imposing it on other countries. Beijing's mantra is that every country should have a right to choose its own path. Well, China is not trying to impose its model on other countries. Its success in improving the lives of its people does create a beacon. Compared with India or the Philippines, systems that we like better, uh, it's an extraordinary success in improving health and education, housing, all those things. We can't beat the influence of that beacon by force or subversion or incentives. We might need to find a way to make democracy in third world countries work better. That's our problem and India's problem. It's not a Chinese threat. Where does this leave us? Well, for the foreseeable future, we have a peer competitor, something that back in the W. Bush administration, we said we wouldn't allow. We can't defeat or dominate China. China can't defeat or dominate us. That peer competitor is not seeking war. The alternative to living with it is nuclear war. A world in which multiple systems coexist is normal in history. We had the good luck of a couple decades in which our system seemed economically and militarily dominant and dominant as a model for human development. China's success together with the 2008 financial crisis and recent political developments in Washington DC and London have pretty severely tar tarnished that model in the eyes of much of the world. If we eschew nuclear war, we're going to have to live with the world as it is, not the world of our dreams. I return to my basic theme. We live in a world of geoeconomics. In the Cold War, we Americans won with a geoeconomic strategy. The World Bank, funded infrastructure, GATT, WTO, IMF, created common standards, our aid programs and institution building programs, supplemented those. The economic success unified uh, our alliance system and our network of friends. Military superiority was essential, but not sufficient. Having won the Cold War, we let the Bretton Woods institutions atrophy. A stingy Congress refused to increase the capital of the World Bank and the IMF. We refused to restructure those institutions so that their governance would reflect the modern world rather than the world of the 1940s. Our Congress in particular was very fearful that the Chinese might gain more influence. We also gutted the State Department budget and started long before President Trump. 
We got rid of US Information Service and we truncated the aid programs. More recently, we've reacted against the price of global leadership. Sometimes in dealing with, with allies, we do pay a price for leadership. Sometimes a leader has to give a little more than it gets. But the prize was leadership to an extent that the world has never seen before. The effort to constrain China to a disproportionately small role has consistently created a vacuum, for instance, leading to a $12 trillion deficit in needed infrastructure spending. China has moved to fill that vacuum. Every time we have tried to constrain China to a disproportionately small role, we've reduced our own role and we've enhanced China's world influence. China's principal effort is the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI. BRI just emulates our Bretton Woods system. It's development banks funding infrastructure and a whole series of initiatives to create common standards, common standards in IT, common standards in customs clearance, uh, co common standards in all sorts of things. Plus institutions to liberalize investment and trade. BRI is a constructive theft of US intellectual property. Moreover, China is now the leader in every form of green energy and is spending more on environmental amelioration than all of Europe or the United States. BRI is an inspiring vision as it was when it was our vision. In Africa, China convenes four dozen heads of state, talks about development, and then it delivers roads and railroads and other kinds of investment. Uh, we Americans put a special forces team in each country uh, to, to combat terrorists, and we maintain an offshore uh, naval military presence. Well, that's the way the game is played. China wins consistently. And its development process, its development successes reduce the risk of terrorism. Our greatest source of recent influence in Africa was George W. Bush's HIV initiative. The U.S. has three potential responses to BRI. First, it can, it can compete. This is our game. We're good at it. But we largely withdrew from the field. The Japanese do compete successfully. China gets a BRI deal for a power plant in Indonesia. It's offering second-rate technology big debts, demands a state guarantee. Japan comes in, says, we'll offer first-rate technology, decades of reliability, and we'll do field tests uh, so that no state guarantee will be needed. Japan wins, Indonesia wins. Used to be us competing with Japan in Indonesia. Uh, second, we can compete and co-opt. We face the same situation with Japan. Japan was competing unfairly in the same ways that China does now. 
we gradually negotiated some common standards. We and the Japanese both won. Uh, more importantly, third world countries won. The key new Chinese institution, which, which shows where they want to go, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, is run by a guy who's a veteran of the World Bank and of the Asian Development Bank. Many of the projects it funds are done jointly with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. He wants to be like them, only he wants to have an institution that's much more decisive than the Bretton Woods institutions have become. Or there's a third possibility. We can stand on the sidelines and whine. That's mostly been our choice so far. Not only is this a competition we can win, but we win even when BRI succeeds. When successful Bretton Woods or BRI programs stabilize countries, the whole world is aware. And because of our national security involvement everywhere, we're a particular winner. I mentioned that Indonesia had more Islamic jihadis than all the rest of the world combined. Out of the Japanese American competition came Indonesia's success. If we had focused on military in Indonesia, we'd still be fighting and losing half a century later. Now let's look at Bangladesh. When Bangladesh was founded in the early 1970s, everybody knew it was going to be a, a basket case. Kissinger was very eloquent about that. This is going to be the ultimate failed state. It was destined to become a kind of giant jungle Somalia, spewing Islamic terrorists all over the world. What happened? Well, when wages rose in China, a lot of factories started moving to Bangladesh. They employed so many Bangladeshi women, mainly women, it stabilized the country. Now, who were the predominant owners of those factories? Americans were the largest owners. This stabilization of Bangladesh is a joint Sino-American success. Nobody ever writes about that, but once you say it, it's clear. Now look at Ethiopia. Until recently, Ethiopia had six violently contending Leninist parties and had one of the worst famines in modern history. Recently, Ethiopia has been the fastest growing country in the world. The largest foreign contributor to that is China. And the latest political development in Ethiopia is a um, a modest liberalization of its politics. So this is mainly a Chinese success. I would argue that each of these successes saves America about a trillion dollars off its future national security budget. We never get that into the calculation. The outcome of BRI is unclear. What BRI means, how it works, changes quite frequently. But what's important is that China's playing the right game. The US is not. Why is the US failing to play the right game when it was so successful playing the right game in the Cold War? A small part of the problem is that 
our scholars have failed to articulate the nature of the game. But the big part of the problem is that in peacetime, resources are allocated by the Congress, which responds to lobbyists. The State Department has no effective lobby. AID has no effective lobby. U.S. Information Service had no effective lobby. The military industrial complex has what may be the biggest lobby in world history. Our problem is not a self-aggrandizing military. In fact, our top military officers are the most conscious people in our country that we've left the military on its own. General Mattis said, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition, unquote. If we don't re-engage all the instruments of national power, then we're not just going to waste ammunition. We're going to waste the lives of a lot of soldiers. So competition, cooperation. In national security, this combination of cooperation and competition mirrors the economics. You know the conflicts, they're in the paper every week. They're very important, but also the world's greatest threat of nuclear war is North Korea. Our policies and Chinese policies overlap about 90 to 95% on North Korea. Middle East stability matters even more to China than it does to us because they get a lot more of their oil from the Middle East than we do. We combine our efforts against piracy. The greatest threats we face are environmental deg degradation and climate change. The national security benefits of the global development created by Sino-American collaboration are never counted, but they're vital. Again, Chinese leaders are very conscious of the common interests, and they don't try to undermine democracies the way Russia does. So what are the overarching issues? If we want to live in a peaceful world, we Americans are going to have to accept that we have a peer competitor. We can manage that or choose nuclear war. China wants to be number one very much, but it's not trying to destroy us. We can no longer rule the seas to the beaches of Fujian. We can no longer control space by ourselves. We can no longer set IT standards by ourselves. No strategy will get us to some dominant end state. The future is just competition forever. That's very difficult for us, for us Americans. Again, whenever we've tried to, to confine China to a disproportionately small role, we've ended up enhancing their influence and reducing our own. We have to live in the world as it is. China's challenge is that it has to grow up. If it wants to be a big power, a global leader, it can't aggrandize the South China Sea as if it were a little country like the Philippines. If it's a great power, then it can't play the victim because of its century of weakness that was now very long ago. If it has four of the world's largest banks, and it does, it can't use infant industry arguments to pr protect its banks from competition. If it wants Huawei to be able to take over the whole world of 5G, then it's going to have to let foreign companies compete for similarly dominant positions inside China. 
Adolescence can be a dangerous time. The current Chinese administration is not progressing further toward adulthood. While the US can coexist with China, it still has to compete successfully. General Motors can win while Tesla and Toyota win too, but the competition is fierce. In the Cold War, we implemented all the elements of national power. The military refers to these as dime, diplomacy, information, military, economic. Now we have the world's finest military, but we've allowed the other instruments to atrophy. We have a military budget as large as the eight next powers, but it's never enough. Our military is always exhausted. We don't lose, but we don't win. America can succeed only if we recognize that since World War II, we're contesting in a new game. It's time to restore a national security strategy for the new game. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Overholt. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so now that uh, now uh, we also have our co-president of Branch and Assignment join us, Jackson. Uh, Jackson, do you have any question to address to Dr. Overholt? Um, Sure, uh, I'll shoot one if that's okay. Um, you talk about if the Chinese BRI and how the US could either basically choose to compete with the BRI, work with China and compete with the BRI, or just kind of whine about it. Um, has the US had a history of being able to work well with developing countries and sort of developing and improving life in those countries? And would the US be able to adopt a strategy to do that, do you think? We have a great record in working with developing countries uh, to help them. Um, that's in many ways the story of the East Asian miracle. Uh, after helping Japan get back on its feet, uh, we supported South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and uh, Malaysia and, and Thailand. Uh, in many ways, this is the greatest uh, success of its kind in world history. In fact, the early period of China's economic takeoff uh, was an extension of that. Uh, we opened our markets to China. We uh, sent our development experts to be useful, the World Bank, and particularly the World Bank, and the ADB and the IMF, uh, no, the institutions we created uh, were absolutely decisive. So yeah, we're really good at that when we set our mind to it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, one final follow-up question that I'd have. Uh, is we uh, we live in a uncertain time and we have a lot of changes both globally and in the United States uh, whether it is a light of COVID-19 or it is the light of the new elections coming up how what are your predictions uh, regarding the U.S. China Sino China Sino U.S. relationship moving forward uh, as a result of the dynamics and the power shift that might have been influenced both by a potential re-election of Trump or a election of Biden and by China being at a faster recovery stage than United States in the coronavirus crisis. We're in a period where leadership of both political parties, not just Trump, uh, is in an extremely anti-China mood. Uh, that is not going to change radically, uh, no matter who is elected uh, in, in November. Uh, 
the people around Biden tend to be uh, more careful, calculating experts than the people around Trump. I mean, Trump doesn't like experts. Uh, uh, he hires people who often have no expertise. Uh, but if you look at Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, and what the candidates said about China in the debates, uh, I think China's doing a, a lot of bad things. And, and China's role is more destructive under its current administration than it has been. Uh, partly it's more destructive just because it, it hasn't grown up. Uh, let me elaborate that a little bit. You have several companies competing to run 5G for the world. Now, Huawei has access to the China market, which is the biggest and fastest growing, and to the US market and to the European market. Ericsson and Nokia only have access to the US and European markets. So Huawei's research and development budget can be twice that of the European companies. And the outcome of that is the destruction of the non-Chinese companies. Same thing is happening with credit cards. Union Pay is not a better credit card company than Visa and MasterCard, but because it has access to all, all three markets, it's got a much larger market share globally than Visa and MasterCard. The continuation of current Chinese policies means the destruction of a huge swath of companies throughout the Western world. It's not going to be allowed. Uh, there were a lot of signs that China, before, that China was uh, preparing to deal with this new situation. A, a baby power and a big power can't behave the same way. Uh, same thing with some of the maritime issues. So uh, we're on a we're on a very bad course. I, I try to be a little countercyclical and say, you know, uh, we have to give both sides of the balance sheet. There's a lot of bad stuff and there's a lot of good stuff. And a, uh, a sensible strategist doesn't get emotional and say, oh, there'd be apotheosis of evil. Um, we need some very fundamental changes on both sides or, or we're both in serious trouble. Thank you very much. And thank you again so much for joining us here at Brunch on a Summit. Thank you.